this election, and we will finish what we started in 2008 and remind the world why the United States of America is the greatest nation on earth. A president aiming for four more years. This is about America, the country we love. It's in trouble. It needs our help. We're going to take it back and make sure America remains the hope of the earth. A challenger aiming to stop it. It's been a long road for them and for us. In America, we celebrate success. We don't apologize for success. If you reject the notion that our government is forever beholden to the highest bidder. The convention speeches. It took the president 14 days before he called the attack in Benghazi an act of terror. He did, in, in fact, sir, call it an act of Can terror. Can you say that a little louder, Candace? A few weeks ago, that you indicated that we should still have troops in Iraq. No, I doubt that. I'm sorry, that's a, that, you, I, you I indicated a, the, the post-debate spins. God bless the people of Wisconsin. I need Iowa. You know where I stand. Turn out the vote for me. And finally, the voting. And a president re-elect. It started like this. And you've been selling to underage children. After weeks of investigating, Nine News Now reporter Andrea McCarran launched a series of explosive reports on underage drinking by outing a store selling to kids as young as 14. In those two years, have you ever been asked for ID? Like once. Then the threat started. But Andrea says she's been stunned and heartbroken to find herself subjected to online name calling too foul to spell out on TV and threats that the cops took so seriously, they posted a police car in front of her home all weekend long. Now with media around the world buzzing over these reports, we bring local parents the next frightening chapter. Nine wants you to know. This is 9 News Now. Yeah, I'm on MacArthur Boulevard near Fox Hall Road in front of Town Square Market. The mother of a 16-year-old tipped us off to this liquor store after she learned her daughter was buying vodka and beer here every week. Place like this, do you even need a fake ID? Uh, usually no. For several weeks, we watched and videotaped dozens of teenagers buying alcohol at Town Square Market in Northwest Washington without being asked for identification. I'm 18, it is very easy, and what we've been buying here for like almost two years. In those two years, have you ever been asked for ID? Like once. Hey, hey, what's up? Night after night, with the help of a 23-year-old Nine News Now staff member, we interviewed the young buyers using a hidden microphone. I heard this is a place to let go yeah. with an ID. It is. Wait, without one or with a crappy one? I mean, like both. I'm just looking for a place to buy. Either way, yeah, get, you can give this a shot. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Have y'all done We've it before? Every year. Most told us they were 16 years old. Some were even buying for their younger friends. And so I'm just wondering how you're 16 years old and you're buying for two minors. Did you use your fake ID? No. How did you buy then? Uh, it was, I just purchased it there. I'm a reporter. Yeah. And I just watched you buy. Yeah. And you're not 21. Sorry. Been an ID here. He didn't ID us. He didn't ID you tonight? No, no, he just didn't, no. Many said they've been coming here to buy booze illegally for two to three years from across Montgomery County, D.C., and Northern Virginia. We keep it pretty safe, usually. Like, where we drink, we sleep. We don't drive and do any of that stuff. After alerting police to what appears to be a booming underage business here, we went inside to talk to the store owner. Sir, we are with Channel 9 News. We've been watching your store for weeks and weeks, and you've been selling to underage children. It is illegal no to sell under 21. No, no ID, no sale. The confrontation no became heated. 16-year-olds, 14-year-olds no. buying natural ice coming no. out of here with cases of beer. Miss, I check everybody. Why you complain? Why you complain? Because I've seen children buying here. No! Everybody come here, little bring here. I check ID boys. The store owner steadfastly denied selling to minors. You want us to come back, bring you no. video of all the children you've sold to? No, no, sir. No children, no sir. Get out here. There's somebody's store. Again, we alerted Metropolitan Police to this store two months ago. The department in turn contacted ABRA, D.C.'s Alcohol Control Board. Yet, the only citation ever issued to this business was back in 2010. 
not for selling to minors, but for selling four packs of beer when the store has an agreement only to sell six packs or larger quantities. The owner of Town Square Market is under arrest tonight after a joint operation by the Metropolitan Police Department and ABRA, D.C.'s Liquor Control Board. The district is infamously known to have some of the worst drivers and most congested streets in the country. Now you can add disobedient city bicyclists to the list. It's just a haste thing, you know, everyone's in a hurry. But it's still illegal to run red lights on a bike, not to mention dangerous. And that's exactly what we saw in DuPont Circle over and over again. This cyclist seemed to be more interested in showing off for our camera than obeying the red light. Nine News photographer James Hash strapped on a helmet cam to get a closer look at the naughty cyclists. But check out what we saw from another camera. James is stopped at the light and gets passed by a daring cyclist who never stopped. This guy speeds through a red light and darts in front of a metro bus that narrowly misses him. So by now you get the point. This happens all the time. But what's just as interesting is the reason some of these bicyclists give as to why they disobey the road rules. We're doing a story on bicyclists who yeah. run red lights. Did you realize you just ran like three of them? I don't even pay attention. I'm a bicycle courier and I do that all day. I saw you run that light there. You do that a lot? Uh, I don't want to talk about it on camera. Before. I definitely know the rules and it's miraculous and I'm thankful to Jesus that but not all cyclists are as unapologetic about ignoring the rules and exercising courtesy on the streets. In fact, this rider says he makes it a point to be responsible. I want to be respected by motorists when they're out driving because you know, they uh, can easily you know, harm and kill me if they don't respect me as a cyclist. Pedestrians and drivers alike say they're constantly having near misses with rogue cyclists. And some are left trying to make sense of this kind of disregard for safety. There's a sense of self-importance, like the universe revolves around them, everyone will be careful, but traffic safety is a community activity. Good morning, I'm Andrea Run. You're looking at live pictures of police in riot gear with clubs. There are horses there. This is at McPherson Square, the Occupy DC encampment, and police are there to move these protesters from this site. Now they had given notice on Monday, and now after that period of time, they said it is time to clear McPherson Square. We have several reporters on the scene. Let's toss to Bruce Lashan, who's live at McPherson Square right now. Bruce. Yeah, Mike, just within the last two minutes or so, the police, the park police, moved into the square in force. You can see their horses here. Uh, they have uh, scores of officers with riot equipment that are back in there. And for the protesters, this is the last stand right here. You want to say you want to say something, but you. But okay, you need to keep. No, no profanity. No okay. Profanity okay. Go ahead. If this country enforced its banking laws like park, uh, like the Park Service regulations, we wouldn't be in this park. I the park police that. are in charge of this right here. Okay. I understand that, but I'm just saying you need to communicate that with them. This is exactly okay. our whole problem. You want a beer? Right. Anyone? Anyone? I would like that. Yes. I was just yes. You're not gonna get Anyone want a beer? So. This has kind of been the hallmark of the of the uh, of the situation with the park police that they've they've actually had great good humor and a fairly uh, good relationship, I think, uh, with the protesters. Good morning. It is 5:46 on this Tuesday morning. We are here on Nine News now. Look who's with us. <laughs> We have we have a Henry Winkler is Henry here. Henry Winkler is here. I'm so excited. Welcome to we're the house. We're excited. Yes, we Thank are you. very excited. He's going to be on the Hill today. We're going to interview him in a few minutes coming up, but we were just so excited to have him in the studio that we wanted to share mm -hmm. the weather yeah. report with him. And he's offered fun. to help Howard out doing weather, you know. Uh, you want to walk with me? Let's go. Sure. All right. All right. Take right. it away. Yeah. Yeah. This is fun for me. We'll get you going with the bus stop forecast here. Where are we going? We're going this way. In okay. the other room. They got in the other room, but our bus stop forecast this morning. Oh, sure. What do we got? We got the bus coming? Because the kids. Pick, exactly. The, the kids. kids. The kids. Absolutely. So what do we got? We got some scattered Gotta showers out there. keep them dry. You've done this before? No. Oh. But um, this, okay. is, this is wonderful. So the children uh, will wear on their, their slickers today. Uh, I wanted to know what the weather was like because I'm going to be around Washington. Uh, and uh, it's 68. It, it's, it's 68, At 9 but it's going to be 70, and then it's going to go to 73, and then you'll be muggy, and you'll take another shower, and then but, I'm in the but, way. But better chances that we'll see fewer showers later. Fewer showers later. This is amazing. Thank you, Howard. And <laughs> You're welcome, Henry. Oh, wait a minute. Look. 
Look, you, got you the can left see, and the right. You can see them all coming in here. The little cells, right? Am I right? Yes, the, yes, yes. I watch my news. The cells. The little <laughs> cells are coming in. This is wonderful. There it is. Now I'm soaked. Oh my God, I have to go and change. <laughs> Especially out, out west. Look at, see the darker colors, the reds, the oranges? That's the heavier rainfall. Oh, I here. just thought that that was beautiful. It I is pretty. That was fall. I agree with you. It is gorgeous. I, I actually thought that the leaves were changing on the, uh, the map. So, uh, but they are on the map a little further west. But in Aldi, at Haymarket, these areas back here, this is uh, Fauquier County, and this is Fairfax County and Loudoun County. All those areas, you don't have to be afraid. Okay, all those fine. all those areas are seeing the heavier rains this morning and then sort of breaks up into scattered showers down and here. And then what happens tonight? Tonight, uh, maybe some fog. We'll get there in a second. Okay. How about the temperatures this morning? Do we need a jacket, Henry? Well, uh, no, you know what you do in the uh, in Cumberland anyway? Because uh, it's going to be about 57 in Winchester, 57. Uh, Luray? Luray. 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 Okay. <laughs> I'm going this way. And then, uh, and but uh, otherwise, uh, over here in... Uh, in uh, Wallops Island, it's about 71. Yeah, on the beach, a beautiful area if you've wow. been to the Virginia Capes and stuff. Beautiful yeah. beachy areas. Now this is our Michael and Son weather camera. I should and it's close my coat. Kind of dark. You do whatever you want. Well, I'm now feeling like you. Are you? Yeah. Well, I want people <laughs> like you. Howard huh? and Henry. Temperature H and H doing the weather here. Hello. Almost heaven, Romney. I'd say. A place steeped in history. This is my little town. Welcome to Romney. Romney is the oldest town in the oldest county in West Virginia. And the Republicans have been lobbying to get the presidential nominee who shares the town's name to stop by. We certainly look forward to having President Mitt Romney come here and help celebrate with us. GOP headquarters sits on one side of Route 50. Democratic HQs just across the highway. I just kind of keep them, you over here, you, no. And the Chamber of Commerce sits between them. Talk family, talk schools, talk friends. Just don't talk politics. <laughs> they subscribe to the same philosophy at the Courthouse Corner Cafe. Politics are kind of bad for business. But it doesn't always work. I think Obama is evil. 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 Personally, I prefer Obama. Romney actually has a long history of nasty skirmishes. Back in the Civil War, the town reputedly went back and forth between Union and Confederate forces some 56 times. Abraham Lincoln earned himself one vote in Hampshire County. <laughs> Democrats still outnumber Republicans in Romney by a wide margin. The town supports lots of Democrats for state office, but not for president and not President Obama. I had one man tell me that, oh, he ended that war. Now what are all those soldiers going to do when they come home? They won't have jobs. So many West Virginians dislike President Obama that a convicted felon almost won the Democratic primary. That was very embarrassing. Lots of people in Romney agree that Washington is broken. They don't care about the American people anymore. We're in a mess. We're in a big mess. They just cannot agree on how to fix it. In Romney, West Virginia, Bruce Lashan, 9 News Now. Oh, you know you missed the funky theme song from Hollywood to the holidays. We are just saying, and we've got a lot to talk about with Anita, <laughs> Leslie, and JC about that teen actor from Two and a Half Men, apparently now having a few regrets about all the nasty things he said about his own show. Let me just put it real clearly. I can act a fool about this job that I have here at Channel 9. My pass card would not work in the morning. <laughs> I, really, I always feel this way about wherever you work. If it's that bad, leave. Right. What I thought was funny, though, then Charlie Sheen saying, you know, it's not really this actor's fault. The show's cursed. That's show. what it is. And because the couple has this extreme attachment parenting style. They slept in the same bed with their kids. She breastfed her son till he turned three. Can a marriage survive extreme attachment parenting? It would really be hard to keep the passion alive if every night your kids are in your bed. I was committed to breastfeeding until you get teeth. And when you can <laughs> walk up to me and tell me you're hungry, that's when I and, and you know what? Let me tell you. I don't want to remember that experience. Like if I'm if it goes no. on too late, you're gonna be able to remember it. And that's just something you don't want to think about. I mean, how old were these kids? 16 year olds? <laughs> <laughs> We're ready. You ready? Yes. I'm ready. Miss are Amy. you ready? Yes, we are. You ready, ready too? Yes. All righty. What we're going to do today is to outline your treatment area. What was done in simulation has to match up with this treatment machine. 
face up is the way most breast cancer patients receive whole breast radiation, but at Sibley Memorial Hospital, where J.C. Hayward had her lumpectomy in April, she's being flipped over onto her stomach. It's called prone radiation. The idea is to limit as much as possible the radiation exposure to J.C.'s heart and lungs. Instead of the normal positioning of the breast lying across the chest wall when someone lies on their back and towards their armpit, this brings all the breast tissue together into a way that can be treated much more uniformly um, without cutting through the lung. Radiation oncologist Dr. Victoria Krug says this friendly use of gravity is especially beneficial in women with generous sized breasts whose cancer is on the right side and has not spread to the lymph nodes. This is a treatment that is only for patients who need breast only radiation. JC's radiation therapy is every day for six weeks, but even before her sessions began, she had to be measured and tattooed. The numbers she was telling you were calling out, we're matching them to make sure we're setting up every point that they give to us. With any sort of radiation, precision is the key, really, to, to be able to give good doses of radiation accurately, reproducibly. But even more so with prone radiation, because it's an entirely different setup. The table has an adjustable opening where the breast can fall through. Okay, we're going to get ready to take the first exposure. The radiation beam is delivered only from the left and right, not to the armpit or any part of the chest. A wedge is placed under the healthy breast to keep it out of the radiation field. All right, you can rest your arms. The position can be slightly uncomfortable, but after the initial session, the treatment is over with pretty quickly. I didn't feel anything. Good. Nothing at all. I thought I would feel something. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel anything. It's like an x-ray. Exactly. Gabby Douglas has flipped and tumbled and vaulted her way to gold and made history along the way. But on this side of the Atlantic, some women, and let me be more specific, some black women are solely focused on one thing, her hair. Never mind the fact that she's won two gold medals and is now the first African-American woman to win the coveted all-around gymnastics achievement. Never mind the grueling hours of training and the incredible sacrifices her family made to create a path to fulfilling her Olympic dreams. There is what appears to be a campaign swirling on social media trying to diminish 16-year-old Gabby Douglas's feet because they believe her hair is what matters. Now let me state for the record that in this instance, I am not an unbiased observer. I remember the phone messages left on my work voicemail from some black women here in Washington telling me that at one point my hair wasn't straight enough and that women didn't wear their hair like that here in Washington. And those words still sting today. The conflict over hair and what constitutes beauty goes back centuries. And as a parent, I work to counter all the subconscious messages out there to ensure that my own daughter knows that what makes us different can also make us dynamic. The last time I checked, the balance beam is not a runway. And when Gabby executes her carefully choreographed moves that seem to defy gravity, it's just her, a mat, and a confidence and skill rooted in faith. She's a gymnast, folks. She's 16, but she's inspired young and old, and she deserves those medals for her talent, not for her hair. So let's cut out the remarks about the ponytail and the gel and the bobby pins. Like a lot of you on Twitter and Facebook, I think it's ridiculous that we even have to have this conversation. And while some people espouse their own distorted views on what's beautiful to define her, Gabby's already figured out what really matters. To quote a line from singer Jill Scott, She's already living her life like it's golden. So what do you think? Head over to our Facebook page and give us your opinion. Anita? Three months ago, Katie Ledecky shocked the swimming world by taking the gold at the London Olympics. And today, the Bethesda native hits the water again, but this time maybe just a little less publicity. Just a little. <laughs> just a little. Our Kristen Brissett is live at the Stone Ridge School where Ledecky and the Gators are kicking off their season. Hey, Kristen. Hey guys, yeah, it's been an exciting meet here. There's just this kind of different atmosphere going on. I'll tell you, Katie's already swam three times today. She's got one more left. And I overheard some of the parents and spectators saying, you know, there's Katie Ledecky. She's in the lead right now. So everybody getting a chance to see an, an Olympic gold medal is something that doesn't really happen very often. We take you to one of her, uh, one of her events today. Katie actually smashed two of her own individual school records tonight. 
one in the 200 IM and also in the 100 butterfly. But, you know, despite all the media attention and success, it appears Katie's just slipped right back into being a normal teenager. And joining me, a very familiar face to all of you, Olympic gold medalist Bethesda's own Katie Ledecky. She just wrapped up her first uh, meet of the season with Stone Ridge. But, Katie, I want to start. We first talked to you when you came back in August from the Olympics. How has adjustment been? Has it been hard to go back to being a normal teenager? No, not at all. Everybody at school has been really great and really welcoming and excited. And I've just had a blast sharing the moment with them and just returning to school life and cool life. Some people will say the heart and soul of college football is in Texas. Is that true? No! Uh, okay, what about Michigan? No! Uh, what about California? No! They say it's in the South. Well, we took a trip recently down to uh, Alabama, Tuscaloosa to be specific, to find out. Take a look. Saturday in the South. Football. Get your program right here. There's a saying in these parts. It isn't life or death. It's more serious than that. Well, <laughs> if those words are true, <laughs> this just might be the epicenter of that mindset. <laughs> Welcome to Tuscaloosa, Bama Nation. Population, well, you can read. Tradition runs deep. And the official language? Roll Tide! Roll Tide! Roll Tide, baby! The mascot may be an elephant, but it's a bear that's revered. He made the Alabama community. Well, his name is Bryant. He was named after the bear, so. There are places where fans are passionate about football, and then there's this. You can't explain what happens down here on a Saturday. Let's try. You want to know about college football? This is college out. football. 100,000 strong at Bryant Denny a. Stadium on most Saturdays. Great fans over here. Great football on that field. It's a Roll match out. made in Tuscaloosa heaven. Roll. Tuscaloosa, Alabama, if ever there was one, a theme park for college football. Why is the affection so profound? No protein here? 14 national championships, iconic figures, all of the above. Either way, they come from every inch of the state. We drove about 250 miles. To watch Nick Saban and company jump on another helpless opponent. Every Saturday there's a game here. It's a special day. Amen. The intoxicating passion of March Madness all boils down to billions in cold hard cash for the networks, the universities, and the NCAA. Everyone, it seems, but the students who play the game. Let's go! They are a partner to this thing. It's the only enterprise in the world where the employee has no vested interest. We caught up with 71-year-old Sonny Vaccaro in New Orleans for the Final Four, but nowadays his real passion lies in crisscrossing the country, telling anyone who will listen about what he calls the plantation mentality behind major college sports. Ironic, since Vaccaro made his fortune marketing big money sneaker deals to those very universities. It took me a while to understand that the only people that were being used here were the individual players. Vaccaro's message caught the ear of D.C.-based human rights attorney Michael Hausfeld, who investigated. They're selling the athletes' work, their name, their image, and their likeness, taking all of that money and keeping it themselves. But what about that free college education? Of Division I men's basketball and football, the highest producing revenue sports for the NCAA, have the lowest graduation rates in the classes with the least career-oriented um, curricula. Enlisting former UCLA baller Ed O'Bannon as a lead plaintiff, Hausfelds filed a federal lawsuit arguing the players deserve a percentage of whatever money their sport brings in, including things like jersey sales and video games. And former greats like Bill Russell and Oscar Robertson have jumped on board. Now, the NCAA would not provide an on-camera interview, but did issue a statement Saturday saying, in part, Student athletes often get full scholarships that pay their tuition, room and board, books and fees. Beyond this, the NCAA currently provides more than $60 million annually to help student athletes with true financial need pay for other personal expenses. But it's not just about the money, it's about power. Hausfeld argues the NCAA currently controls pretty much every aspect of a player's career, even how much they can make on a summer job. 
And if the player gets hurt or a coach leaves, that precious scholarship could be gone. It is, he says, the very definition of an uneven playing field. But not every ex-player agrees. Tamir Goodman played at Towson State. I think if the student athletes began to get some money, it will take away from college sports. It will take away from the beauty and the competitiveness of college sport. But Hausfeld says, wake up. That glitter rubbed off a long time ago. They're the wizard. And you're trying to pull back the curtain on them? Yes. Space Shuttle Discovery has had so many firsts. It was the first shuttle to fly after Challenger in Columbia. It's known as the return uh, to orbit. Uh, orbiter and this is because it's just so reliable reliable it had the first female commander the first female pilot and it also had the first mom in space my mom Dr. Annalie Fisher uh, thanks for being with us I know today has been uh, something that you have been uh, I, I guess looking forward to but also very sad about H how are you feeling as we're about to watch it fly over for its final flight it's really a sad day <laughs> I uh, just can't believe that this day has come where we're finally going to be putting the wonderful workhorse of the fleet discovery into a museum. Sad. <laughs> there you have a hundred ton space shuttle on top of a massive 747 making a spectacular low flyover right next door to the Advarhazi Center. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Just listen to the crowd. You want to be an astronaut when you grow up? Yes. Well, you know what? We've got a real life astronaut right over here. Come on over. This is Dr. Anna Fisher. She actually flew on Discovery. Hi, how are you? I love your outfit there. <laughs> Any advice for Ethan, an aspiring astronaut? Study Russian. <laughs> Wow, stu study Russian or perhaps Chinese, right? This report had just returned from China last week. I was there because a book I wrote about my personal journey with heart disease has been translated and published in China. It took 10 visits to the Chinese embassy before I was given a visa. I had to first convince the communist government that I was only going for book signings and sightseeing. This is what I saw once I got to Beijing and Shanghai. China is a country of contradictions, old versus new. My first indelible impression is the number of people in China. There are lots of people. This is the famed Yuyan Garden District in Shanghai, a city of more than 20 million. Hello, people from America capital, Washington, D.C. Welcome to China. Goods and services are plenty, and I found a lot of Chinese in the big cities are content with their improved lives. The government is paying for homes that are being torn down as part of the speedy modernization. China's growth, fueled by cheap labor, hasn't yet run its course as pundits had predicted. When that happens, rising consumption here could soften the blow. Beijing is a smaller city, a mere 15 million people, but this is the capital the center of government and culture in China. It's a crowded capital with lots of cars and SUVs having replaced bikes as the preferred mode of transportation. The government has tried to control the total number of the car on the roads. In Washington, we've only got one crazy beltway, but here they've got five beltways that surround the city. Call it controlled chaos. Before you can have a car, you have to get the license plate first. Right. So right Are they now, expensive? Yeah, it's very expensive. So uh, in some city, it could have cost one third of the total price of the car. Tiananmen Square attracts millions of locals and tourists. And that's not fog that hides this historic area. It's pollution. It's a really big problem and health hazard in China's cities. The millions of people who come here every year, they don't see this just as a tourist destination. A lot of people think there's something spiritual about this place, that it's actually the gateway to heaven. The Communist Party controls the government. Estimates say less than one in 20 Chinese people belong to the party. I have been warned not to stop Chinese people and ask about their government. Any criticism of the party could bring consequences for them and their families. You don't 
make a, be a deal about Tibet. You don't make a deal about the one-party system. You don't make a deal about Taiwan. Jeff Andrews is the American director of the International School in Beijing. He's also a former associate to former D.C. Mayor Adrian Fenty. Jeff has lived in China for 10 months. I don't feel like there are any listening devices in my house. I don't think there are any listening devices in the car that I have. I, 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 no, I, I don't. I saw firsthand that the one-party rule often gets things done at record speed here. Most of these office buildings and condos have been built in the past two and a half decades. Highways and 14-lane boulevards have replaced dirt roads. And while Democrats and Republicans debate universal health care in the U.S., it's already here in China. What kind of operation are you going to do? Are you going to do angioplasty? I got the chance to visit a hospital, specifically a cardiac unit, where I was told the government mandates that basic care be available to everybody, although it may take a while. What happened here? Heart attack or? Uh, yes. Those with money can pay more and often do for more specialized care. Take care. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Can you shake? Can you shake it? Yeah. 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 Like right. So I point out that lots of Chinese people have money today. It's still a developing country, but with 1.3 billion people, it's the largest population in the world with the fastest growing market, second only to the United States. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, ma'am? I'm from Channel 9. Trying to get people to tell the politicians what they think about the fiscal cliff. Fiscal cliff. Fiscal cliff. Fiscal cliff. Fiscal cliff. The fiscal cliff soapbox. Come right on through. How y'all doing? All right, people. It's your chance. Step right up. Fiscal cliff soapbox. We'll give you this beautiful 9 News Now travel mug if you talk to us. Come on. Okay, here we go. Let's go. Come on. So step right up. Get up. Do you worry about your taxes going up? I'm not wealthy. So no. <laughs> if we go over the cliff, the taxes will go up on everybody. 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 Well, let's hope we don't go over the cliff. Tell the politicians what you think of them. My name is Lou Weinstein, and I write novels. Nobody wants to hold up a tax cut for most of the people in this country just so the richest people can avoid paying their fair share. That's absurd. All right, here we go. Let's go off the cliff. Happy to pay the additional taxes if he agrees not to spend any more than he already has. Oh, come on. Give me a break. Of course, the rich will get have to pay more. They can certainly suck it up. No, no. I don't. Okay, I don't know what that means. There's one party you can't add. You don't know what it means at all? No. And the other party are too much of wusses. Fiscal cliff? Dem uh, the, uh, uh, There's money problems. Wait, but, uh, uh, Please don't film me. They're basically wussies. <laughs> Republicans can't add, and the Democrats are wussies. They'll just keep it going so they can keep their jobs. But I'm not dead yet. They're not looking out for us like they're supposed to. Reagan started the whole thing, and I blame him for it. They wouldn't get around to me. I'm, I'm not important. <laughs> we have uh, this beautiful 9 News Now travel mug. Mug. Travel mug. Oh, you get a travel mug out of the deal. Give you a travel mug. The Defense Department doesn't need anywhere near what it's getting now. We have enough weapons to kill everybody on this planet several times over. Bad. Rubson, Bill Rubson. I'd say go over the fiscal cliff. What they should have been doing as our elected officials is working on a solution. Thank you for having me on the soapbox, you know, and it was a pleasure to meet you. Hopefully I get your card at the end of this. I think that pretty much sums it up. You have two minutes to tell the politicians what you think about the fiscal cliff, do you? I don't think so. Really? <laughs> I don't have any opinions. You don't have any opinions? <laughs> Whoa. Hey, hey, guys. Whoa. The Rehoboth Bay has spilled over to the road here. The water actually just pouring over uh, the seawall now. Uh, we expected an unprecedented storm here in New York City. And that's what we got. The power pole snapped in two, then the tree is still on the house. Driving through something like that, incredibly dangerous. Bay Bridge now shut down the eastern shore, cut off. This massive tree comes crashing down. A 100-year-old oak tree. We have had an awful lot of reports of flooding. We've seen a lot of flooding, especially over off of the Delaware uh, Bay. success, uh, you might say, uh, never ends when it comes like this. Well, go goes the music that's continually going on and on and on, and you might take a break in between, you know, and everybody could join in, the audience participating. Got a Grammy nomination? Oh my God, unbelievable!
President Bush invited me to the White House three times this year already. Yeah. Not to play, just to be there. And just to be there. You're a Republican? No, indeed. <laughs> I was wondering why he invited me. You ain't got that old But I still got the desire, still got a little fire, still getting hired. I ain't been fired, so I'm going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> How do you want them to remember Chuck Brown? Well, just like you see me. <laughs> just like now, because right now, I'm just enjoying every minute uh, of, 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 of being on this planet. Hey, let me shake your hand. Yeah. I should. You can remember me as a nice old humble guy, still trying to trying to kick it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was set on fire with gasoline. The faces of domestic violence. He had beat me and raped me. Tell the stories of pain and perseverance. Tonight, Nine wants you to know domestic violence is never okay. And this newscast is here to help. This is Nine News Now. She did everything she was supposed to. Sadly, that could be the epitaph for any number of domestic violence victims, including Heather McGuire. She is the woman shot in the head and killed. Her body dumped in the middle of busy Connecticut Avenue in Kensington by an estranged husband who would hours later kill himself. Well, tonight, Nine wants you to know it did not have to end this way, and it does not have to for those still desperately struggling in abusive relationships. We'll talk about the way out and the pain left behind. But first, Heather McGuire, a woman who apparently trusted the system to protect her, or at least hoped it would be enough. This grainy black and white video from a nearby gas station camera belies the bloody carnage playing out on Connecticut Avenue in Kensington Tuesday morning when Philip Gilberte made good on his reported threat to kill his estranged wife, Heather McGuire. He shot her in the head and dumped her body at Connecticut Avenue in Knowles. Hours later, police found Gilberte's body in a house in Rockville. He'd apparently killed himself. Just three days earlier, McGuire had gone to a Rockville court commissioner, apparently terrified, saying Gilberti had been lurking outside her home. She believed he might kill her. Authorities stepped in. They arrested Gilberti twice over the weekend for violating a protective order. But each time he got out, the last time the judge releasing him on a $57,000 unsecured bond. The judge who made the ruling in this case is a good judge. He is a good judge. Unfortunately, I, I, it's, been, I, it's come to my attention that apparently the computers in the courtroom were down to some of the criminal history of this guy was not available. Gilberti's criminal history stretches back decades. Assault, drugs, steroids, seven years in a Nevada prison for trying to kill another girlfriend. And tonight, our Bruce Lashan asked the critical question. Did the system fail Heather McGuire? Uh, I will say that Heather McGuire did everything she needed to do. One in four women in this country have experienced severe physical violence from their partner. That's according to the CDC. And here's, there is no way to ignore this next statistic. Women who leave their abusers, especially at first, are at 75% greater risk of severe injury or death than those who stay. So the crucial question is, how does a woman get out, but in a way that keeps her safe? For that, we got some straight answers and advice from TV's Dr. Phil. Earlier this year, I had a chance to sit down with a psychologist at his studios in Los Angeles. He says one of the reasons he launched his talk show 10 years ago was to end the silence that often surrounds domestic violence. There's a right way and a wrong way to get out of a violent relationship. And if you do it the wrong way, you are really at risk. The highest risk you ever have for serious injury or death in a violent relationship are the weeks immediately after you leave that relationship. You don't watch the Dr. Phil show or, or some other uh, dealing with this and become all empowered and get up in your abuser's face. Say, all right, I'm a strong woman, I'm gonna get in his face, you're not ever gonna do that to me again. That's a good way to get killed because there's an imbalance of power there. Men are bigger, they're stronger, we're built different, our muscular is different. You know, yes. a big part of domestic violence is control. And when they feel the control slipping away, they panic, they get frustrated, and so they up the ante. And that's when they're likely to 
chase you down, find you, hurt you, kill you in some way. Dr. Phil says the best way to leave is with a concrete exit plan. Have a packed suitcase ready, a second set of keys made, and if possible, all vital documents, birth certificates, passports, insurance policies ready to go. But Peg hex Kalo with the District Alliance for Safe Housing, or DASH, says for some, the first step may be realizing you are in an abusive relationship. Because abuse can be so many different things than just physical abuse. It can include intimidation, isolation, economic abuse, using children. So there are a lot of different ways that it manifests. Hex Kalo says after you've recognized there is in fact a problem, call and get some help. Contact the police or a safe house. In fact, her organization provides shelter and counseling to women who've left those abusive relationships. Tonight, Gary Nuremberg learned how some of them broke free. Yeah. In their own apartments with their kids, these survivors of abuse now have hope and memories of the pain. I was unconscious. I ended up, um, he broke my nose. He, I have a, I had a concussion. I had injuries by hitting, um, slapping, um, throwing an ashtray across my face in front of my son, a um, glass ashtray throw it across the room and slash my face. He had beat me and raped me so bad that, and my daughter was in the house. She didn't see, but I know that she heard, she heard mommy holler, man. She heard mommy saying, stop. <laughs> He wouldn't. So the next day, not the, ne the next day, I planned just to get what I could get and to get out. My son said something to me, Ma, this is not good. We cannot live like this. And those words helped me to make the decision. As in the hospital, I said, no more, I'm not going back. I said, I'm not going back. And then um, I called a, a shelter hotline, a hotline number. At Dash, she has her own apartment with her son. I think I did a good job with decorating it. This is my kitchen. Just having a safe place. And she gave me the key to open the door. I fell to my knees and kissed the floor because I, I was just so happy. I felt safe. It was just like a, a new awakening. I was just so grateful. That's the word. I was just so grateful that it was a place that I could go with my baby and feel safe. But it takes a decision. Try to get that inner strength that is inside, look around, especially at the kids, look at the sadness in their eyes, look at the sadness in the mirror in your eyes, and say enough is enough. It's not going to get any better unless I make a change now. I see something big coming for me. I'm so blessed. <laughs> These are tears of joy right now. I am so blessed. It's awesome. It's awesome. If you want it, you can get it. It's right here. It's right here. You can get it. With that first step, uh, yeah. Yeah. Gary Nuremberg, oh, 9 News Now. Some very powerful encouragement there. And if you want to see Gary's full interviews with each of those women, log on to WSA9.com. Plus, you'll also find a link to the Dash website, which has some tests you can take to determine if you are the victim of abuse. Because remember, not all of it is physical. Just go to WSA9.com. Anita. Joining me now, Derek, is Yvette Cade, a survivor of a vicious attack by her abusive husband seven years ago when he cornered you, poured gasoline on you, set you on fire, 60% of your body burned. Also joining us is your adult daughter, Champagne. Thank you for being here, ladies. Thank you. You tried to use protective orders, but it wasn't enough. It was not enough. Getting a protective order is only a piece of paper. At that point, you are really in danger by the perpetrator. My ex-husband, ex we were separated for 10 months, 
and I thought that, you know, things were going to go well and I could get my divorce. But that only set his um, anxiety and wanted to know what I was doing. It made him very angry. And now you've gone from, from being a victim to an advocate, and you were telling me earlier, you tell women about getting that support network, letting coworkers know what's going on. What do you tell women who are trying to get out? I tell women that you need to have a, a plan. Uh, you can call the House of Ruth, the National Domestic Ho Violence Hotline, right. and just get all the support that you can. You need to let as many people know around you, on your job, whatever, wherever you go and that he knew of, let them know that your life is in danger so they can all be prepared for what's, what may or may not happen. Right, because so many women stay silent and don't tell the people around them about that. Let's talk to you, Champagne. What about the children who go through this and then move on into their adult lives? What advice can you give having been through this for those people? Um, you want your children to be able to come and talk to you and have the knowledge and confidence to deal with their emotions and know that you're there in situations like these. And so again, we're talking about what we've been saying all along is stopping the silence, talking about it, and making sure you have resources for help, not just a piece of paper. Yes, there is a national teen domestic violence hotline for the children to As well. be able to, if they don't feel com comfortable talking to their parents, they can reach out to organizations and they'll give them different avenues. Let's hope that many more people do reach out and get out. Thank yes. you, ladies. Thank you. Still ahead tonight, a health alert. There are new guidelines for women on a certain kind of cancer screening. Plus, Virginia Tech found guilty of negligence in the 2007 school shootings. We have reaction. And is the Washington Monument sinking? Why the government wants to know. That's coming up. And I'm meteorologist Topper Shot. 81 today, not a record high, but more like June. Here's your wake up weather. Another mild start. Temperatures 48 to 58 at 5 o'clock, 48 to 56 at 7 o'clock, and really jumping by 9, 55 to 65. It's so another warm start. We'll come back. We'll talk about the prospect of breaking record highs tomorrow and tell you about a celestial treat you could see tonight. Nearly five years after the Virginia Tech massacre, families of two of the victims won their wrongful death lawsuit today against the university. As Matt Jablo tells us, the families say the verdict proves the school's response to those shootings was inadequate. Virginia Tech administrators, however, continue to insist otherwise. And award him damages in the sum of $4 million with interest from not It was a release of emotion several years in the making after an eight-day trial and three hours of deliberations, a jury awarded the families of two slain Virginia Tech students $4 million apiece. <laughs> the wrongful death lawsuit was brought against Virginia Tech by the families of Erin Peterson, a Chantilly resident who was a freshman at the time of the shootings. She couldn't speak anymore, so we had to do it. And Julia Pride, who was a 23-year-old graduate student from New Jersey. It certainly was an end of a long, process for us. Most of the families of the massacres, 30 other murder victims, agreed to an $11 million settlement reached back in 2008. Lawyers in this case successfully argued that Peterson and Pride, who were killed in Norris Hall, might still be alive today if Virginia Tech police had warned the campus of the initial shootings in a Virginia Tech dormitory. Strength, truth, she spoke for other people. After the verdict was read, the Peterson and Pride families talked about their lost loved ones and about the painful road that led to their victory in court. She always put herself in a position to speak for people who were too weak to speak for themselves. We wanted to get a little bit more truth, a little bit of accountability, and we weren't just going to go away. And so we came here, and so this is what happened. Despite the verdict, Virginia Tech continued to insist that neither campus police nor school administrators were negligent the day of the shootings. In a statement, a university spokesman said, quote, the heinous crimes committed by Sung Wee Jo were an unprecedented act of violence that no one could have foreseen. Immediately after the verdict, the state of Virginia filed a motion to reduce the $8 million award, citing state law in Virginia that caps awards in wrongful death lawsuits against the state at $100,000 per case unless the governor agrees to waive the cap. Derek? We'll wonder what Governor McDonald will do. Thank you, Matt. 
Well, the district's Office of Campaign Finance has launched what it calls a random and routine audit of Councilmember Vincent Orange's 2011 campaign. Now, this as Orange is dealing with questions about campaign contributions linked to D.C. businessman Jeff Thompson. Thompson has contracts with City Hall worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and he's also a major campaign donor to just about every single D.C. council member. The FBI and IRS recently raided Thompson's home and office, and sources tell us a handful of D.C. council members have gotten federal subpoenas in connection with an investigation into possible campaign irregularities. Officials at D.C. St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital say a Georgetown man charged with killing his wife may be faking mental illness. However, doctors want more time to evaluate him. We're talking about Albrecht Muth. He's the man accused of killing his 91-year-old wife, Viola Droth. Last month, the judge ruled that Muth is temporarily mentally incompetent to stand trial. In tonight's health alert, a government task force is releasing new guidelines for cervical cancer screening. It recommends healthy women between the ages of 21 and 65 only need to have a pap test every three years, not every year. Plus, women ages 30 and older can extend screening to once every five years if they undergo the HPV test at the same time as the pap and the HPV is negative. Doctors say overscreening is leading to unnecessary procedures and biopsies that can increase complications later in pregnancy. It is as effective in, re in reducing cancer deaths as annual screening, but we have substantially less false positive tests. If she really believes that this is okay for me and this is what's best and then I'll be safe screening every three years, then I would go with that. Now we need to point out this is screening with cervical cancer testing with a pap every three years. This does not mean you do not see your gynecologist every year. That is very important. These recommendations were released by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. The American Cancer Society and other groups have come on board with similar recommendations. Well, is the Washington Monument sinking or perhaps tilting in the wake of last year's earthquake? That's what a team of government surveyors is trying to figure out. Now, the team's not expecting to find any major changes, but they do say the findings could impact plans for repairing the D.C. landmark. As you'll remember, the monument cracked and crumbled during that 5.8 magnitude quake last August, and it's expected to remain closed to visitors until next year. That's really a bummer. So well, many people look forward to that. They do say D.C. is a swamp, so it's perfectly it's possible. possible. It's possible. It might, yeah. All right, we had 81 today, not a record. But now we have a new That's date amazing. on the cherry blossoms. The new peak has been moved up to the 20th to the 23rd. So get the out-of-town folks here quickly. And we have not said this yet. We should point this out. You can't touch the blossoms or the trees or pull them off or anything. Don't touch them. They'll write you a ticket. They take it pretty seriously. Now let's uh, take a live look outside. Now, if you haven't done this, go outside, look to the west. Naked eye, you'll see Jupiter and Venus very close together, and it looks really quite nice, quite spectacular. This is our live weather cam brought to you by... Michael and son, I want to show it to you with a weather cam. You just can't see it with a camera, just like two little dots. But trust me, it's very, very spectacular. Winds out of the south at 7. Pressure rising 30.19 inches of mercury. And look at that temperature, 66 still downtown at 11 o'clock in mid-March. That's a little weird. All right, here's the deal. You're going to need shades tomorrow, but uh, no jacket. It'll be plenty warm. Record highs are possible. Record high tomorrow is 81 at National, 82 at Dulles, 82 at BWI. All of those are going to be threatened. More like June. That's when we see temps in the 80s. Afternoon thunderstorm possible tomorrow. Isolated, a much better chance, however, tomorrow night and into Friday. So overnight, clear skies, mild again. Zero to no blankets, zero to one blanket, I guess. 48 to 56 and winds light. And that's a good thing. You know, we had a lot of warm air last week, but we had those strong winds with it. Not, not the case tomorrow. Mostly sunny in the morning. Grab your shades, 50s and 60s with light winds. And then even in the afternoon with temperatures in the low to mid 80s, Winds only out of the southwest at 10. That's a pretty nice day. Partly cloudy, even warmer. Yes, we'll keep the chance of a shower or a thunderstorm in. They'll be few and far between and primarily uh, west of I-81 and particularly in the mountains. High temps tomorrow, 83 downtown, 83 in Arlington, 81 in Reston. These may be low too. 80 in Leesburg and Manassas. Clouds come in there a little bit uh, quicker, but 83 in College Park, low 80s in Bowie and low 80s down into southern Maryland into Charles County. So let's uh, go ahead and break it down for you to start. We're looking at 52 to 60 with generally clear skies. By noon, some areas will be over 80. 76 to 81 by noon. By evening, 78 to 84. An isolated shower or a thunderstorm is possible. Now, the next three days, a much better chance of showers and storms on Friday. We, you know, get docked a little bit in terms of temperatures, but still 74. 
Saturday, SunTrust Rock and Roll Marathon, fantastic. A slight chance of a shower in the morning and evening, but I tell you what, should not affect anything. 74 degrees. If you're running the race, it'll be in the upper 50s and low 60s during the race. Now, the next seven days, we stay pretty warm. I mean, generally in the uh, 70s, uh, we're looking at temperatures low to mid 70s as we get into the weekend. We'll keep Sunday dry, a little bit cooler than mid 70s on Monday, maybe a shower. Uh, spring officially arrives on Tuesday, of course, seems like it was here in February, uh, 76 <laughs> and then 76, maybe a shower on Wednesday. So uh, blossoms are going to, I mean, everything's popping like crazy right now. The next week's going to be crazy. I can yes. feel it in my allergies too. Yeah, Woo. pollen is high. Good point. Yeah. All right. We'll uh, Kristen Brissett's up next with sports. We'll see you then. Now, nine sports with Kristen Brissett, the best sports in town. The expectations for Georgetown this year weren't very high with the roster stock mostly of freshmen and sophomores, but the Hoyas defied critics finishing fifth in the conference and are going dancing for the sixth time in the last eight years. As a number three seed in the Midwest region, the Hoyas will face 14th seeded Belmont on Friday. JT3 and the gang loaded their gear and themselves onto a bus this afternoon to begin their journey to Columbus. Despite their numerous appearances in the NCAA tournament in the past, the Hoyas haven't had much success getting upset in the first round the last two years. So emotions were running high as the team left D.C. It's a lot of emotions. You know, we try to put them to the side, not really think about it too much. But, you know, when we step on that court, it definitely, you know, plays a part and the intensity level goes up just that much higher. This season is, you know, starting to wind down. You know, the last time I'll be playing college basketball. But I try not to think about it. I try to, you know, focus on the game. The Georgia, or as I said, the Hoyas will play at 3 this Friday in Columbus. That game will be broadcast on True TV. You can go to WSA9.com to find out where to tune in. Dave Owens will be live from Columbus starting tomorrow. NCAA hoops action tonight. Pat Knight and the Lamar Cardinals taking on Vermont. Catamounts freshman for McGlynn was on fire. Four hits the three pointer. He had 18 points off the bench as Vermont advances to play North Carolina. The Redskins, his topper laughs. The Redskins wasted no time in free agency, adding to the receiving core. They signed Pierre Garcon from Indianapolis and Josh Morgan from San Francisco, and they haven't given up yet on getting Eddie Royal. But now it seems they've turned their attention to defense. They have some serious holes to fill in the secondary after releasing safety of Shimago Atagwe on Monday and the looming possibility that they won't re-sign Leron Landry. Today, the Redskins hosted Chicago Bears safety and two-time Pro Bowler Brandon Merriweather and are expected to host cornerback Aaron Ross from the New York Giants on Friday. Ross finished last season with four interceptions and 60 tackles. Time now to turn our attention to high school in our Game of the Week poll. Spring sports gearing up among your choices in boys lacrosse. We have O'Connell. Uh, Langley versus O'Connell and Battlefield taking on Westfield. And we've also got girls lacrosse and girls softball. Go to dc.highschoolsports.net to vote. Down in Kissimmee, Steven Strasburg getting the start today against Atlanta. Not his greatest outing. Three runs already given up. Jason Hayward takes another. That's the Braves' second home run of the day off the almighty righty. And the Nats lose 6-5. to five. So Not the greatest day for Strasburg, but he'll, he'll rebound. Pick he'll pick it. He'll pick it up. We'll be right back. Don't forget, WUSA is your home for this year's SunTrust Rock and Roll Marathon. The race is Saturday, March 17th, takes runners through all four quadrants of D.C. Andrea Rohn and Mike Heideck anchor our live coverage 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. You want to know more? Get to the website, WUSA9.com. Good night, everybody. Good night.